Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Divine Feminine Healers podcast. I am so excited to have on Katie Silcox back on the podcast for a third episode um, from Shakti School. Thank you so much for being here, Katie. Is it really our third? That's amazing. I knew it wasn't definitely not our first. Yeah, I know. I'm th- like third. I think you may be like one of our um, most consistent guests. I'm not totally sure though. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I love asking this question because I think our relationship with the divine feminine changes every day, every week, every year. So I would love to hear from you. How are you currently experiencing your divine feminine energy? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the feminine. It is the ultimate malleable thing. It it changes given the situation, the circumstance, what we need. And for me, it's showing up lately as just this real sense of being truly um, held in this place of love, despite what is going on in my life, despite what I may have done right or wrong, despite, you know, everything that, that, that we're doing, there is this, there is this presence that can hold us that doesn't judge us. And I think, you know, in my own mind, and I think many listeners probably feel the same way. I can be really judgmental of myself. I, I can hold myself to just the most ridiculous standards and when I've been able to really stop and and tune into what you and I might call that inner light or that love or that presence, the divine feminine, um, there's no judgment. It's, and that's what a mom does. That's what a good mom, you know, a mom's not like, you know what? I really love you. If you (laughs) do X, Y, and Z, like mama energy is like, no matter what you do, even if I don't like you, and even if I don't agree with it, I will always love you. And that's the way it's showing up for me lately. That's really beautiful because I was just thinking I'm in a time in my life where I'm really proud of what's happening in the external world. And I was thinking like, yeah, things are good right now. And I it's easy to love myself and it's easy to receive the love from the universe and from this feminine energy that you can call mother as well. But I'm like, why wasn't I tuned into this frequency when it was really tough? How was I? Like in what, like what I was receiving that love during that time, like it never stops. It was always infinite. So I think like that was such a growth moment for me of like, it's just, this is just one little dot on my journey that it's going to ebb and flow a lot. And like, how can I tune into that frequency of f- receiving that love, even when the circumstances are not like favorable or like what I want them to, for me to be, what helps you to be able to receive that and like, to be able to take the, that step back and see, like, I understand what's happening, this little play in front of me, um, and I'm detaching myself from it and, and learning to see that there's a higher perspective. Yeah, necessity. <laughs> <laughs> I look at you and I see myself, you know, in Angelica, and, and it's so amazing to sit here in my mid-40s and and I hope that I'll be here with you in our my mid eighties, and you'll be like a sprite little whatever sixty five <laughs> or whatever you are, like seventy year old. And to look at the younger woman in you and see all of this wisdom, and and what a great luck karmically that you are so young, and that I was so young, and that we were able to receive these teachings at such a young age, and then you know, Ayurveda talks about these stages of life and listeners that are young, let me just say, it's going to get weird. It's going to get really unexpected. It's nothing that you, nothing you can do now really can prepare you for what's to come situationally on the material world level. And looking from this vantage point of being snap mac dab in the heart of the heart of the midlife crisis let me call back to the younger women and say the practices you do now that you're learning with angelica and you're learning with your teachers and some of you that come to shakti school are going to be the thing that 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 enable you to 
really survive, not just survive the blow of midlife and what unexpected things are coming. And that's not to sound negative, but actually it's those crises, the times when it doesn't feel like the outer world is good or validating you, where the opportunity to be with the divine mother is even more available. Mm. She becomes a necessity. There's no other way. It's like Christ nailed to the cross. Dr. Ladd says, enjoy your crucifixion. Enjoy it because it also is the thing that leads to your resurrection. So for me personally, I'm almost the opposite in a way of what you said. It's like when life's going good, I'm like, who needs the divine mother? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like when she is the fan, that's when I'm like, I'm, I'm humbled by it so much that that's when the presence and the silence and the love that is all around me has been the most available. Thank goodness. Totally. It's so interesting too, with these practices of Ayurveda and yoga. And it's like, I've gone through my own relationships with them and like, they've always ebbed and flowed and something that always stuck with me. I heard you say this one time, I don't know if this has changed, but you said like, you kind of have like a rebellious relationship with Ayurveda. Like sometimes you feel like you're following in and sometimes you're like, no, I'm not doing that. And like, I couldn't agree more because I'm like, don't tell me what to do. And then I'm like, oh, I was actually just restructuring my relationship with that practice or with that thing and expanding it to be even more. And I was kind of doing Ayurveda the whole entire time, but I just didn't really know it. So I'm really curious, like, what is your relationship with Ayurveda right now? And like, how do you, yeah, kind of cope with that push and pull? Because I know it comes with a lot of like, okay, I am have a school here. You know, I'm leading certification programs in Ayurveda. Like I need to be quote unquote, like practicing it to a T, but actually we know that that's like, if that's not authentic to us, that's also gonna not read as authentic to us as well. Yeah, luckily I don't teach the the like rulesy parts of Ayurveda at our school. I get to teach all the like mystical parts, which is my favorite thing. And then we hire like the most amazing people that love doing the like, you know, fun more and you know when I say rules it's not even that but just like the practical application part and that's the part I feel more rebellious with I'm I'm and I do think the more I open to the first principles approach to Ayurveda the more I see exactly what you said and that is in a way I mean when you're not doing it, you're really not doing it but like <laughs> in a way you're doing it all along like you know, the Charaka Samhita says that Ayurveda has to be adapted for the time, place, and the people. And the, just the amount of, of stuff that we're dealing with, whether it be psycho, psycho-emotional, technological, chemical, hormone, hormonal, like these are things that our ancestors all over the globe didn't ever experience. And so the remedies therefore must be more intensive, more, they, they must be different, you know, and, and then we're also dealing with like a globalized populace that's encountering everything all at once. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what was true for the Indian subcontinent thousands of years ago, or even a hundred years ago will be different than you and I, which probably have some ancestral relationship, you know, are what were our, you know, Viking, Scotch, Irish, English <laughs> ancestors eating, you know, or Germanic ancestors eating uh, a thousand years ago and, and how that really is the Ayurveda of our people. And I think we have this really limited idea of Ayurveda. And when we open up to the true brilliance, grandeur and genius of Ayurveda, what we see is that this first principles approach to life can be applied to everyone everywhere at any time. Vata is always going to be Vata. You know, Pitta is always going to be Pitta. Kapha is always going to be Kapha, meaning the way that you are um, deranged, <laughs> neurotic, you know, dried up, you know, overdoing it. That's, uh, that's going to be the same irrespective of your heritage and and similarly for inflammation and burnout and anger and similar for laziness and you know over indulgence and a lot of these more kophic imbalances and so when i really lean into it and i get clear angelica this is the most important thing 
when I tap into the love and the light of my own body and I ask it, please show up, higher mind, spirit, please come be with me. Tell me what I'm supposed to eat tonight. Tell me who I'm supposed to go out on a date with. Tell me how I'm supposed to show up to this meeting at work. I'm in the ultimate sense of svasta, situated in the center of my soul. And that is the definition of health in Ayurveda. And that's the inner healer. That's Danvantare. That's that inner guide that you are the only one that can tap into. As one of our teachers, Mary Thompson says, you, you have your own Ayurveda operating manual. Mm -hmm. Only you knows how to read it and write it. And so that's really what we're trying to teach gals how to do. And also how I'm attempting to, to live my life every day. Gosh, Mary with the knowledge bombs all the time. I love that. Grandma Mary. <laughs> um, when you're in a place of, I think it gets tricky when you're like, for so long you've been following something, it gets scary to the point where you're like, okay, now I can like take off my little training wheels and I can go on my way. Like, how can I trust that this is the voice of my intuition or not that kind of like derangement that is speaking? <laughs> That's a good deep question. A, a really like one of the most important questions in life. How can I tell the difference in the voice of my soul versus the voice of my parts, my ego, my defenses, my senses my you know how and and that is what it means to have a practice there has to be something that everyone is doing daily hopefully weekly monthly but at least sometime that gets us out of the way that we contract around the sense fixated sense of who we are that opens us into this wider wider field the higher mind energy the higher heart doesn't have an eating disorder, doesn't have money issues, doesn't have daddy issues. I'm not saying those jokingly. I'm saying those because I, I understand them in a very raw way. And all of those stories and beliefs, and we call them traumas. We call them in the tradition, karmas. And we get wrapped into them. They're compelling. They draw us in. They convince us of their realness. We fixate around them even more. And from that fixation, we decide and choose and it creates this endless loop, you know? And so the idea is like to step out of the whole setup, not disembodiment, not spiritual bypassing, to step out to the extent to which you can be with the part of your heart, mind that can be the field of love to witness all that suffering and all that pain so as to be probably transformed by it and alchemized by it. But on a practical level for the listeners, it has been my experience that the voice of your soul is always very, mine at least, is very funny, very basic, simple, calm, easy. She speaks in small words. She doesn't even speak in words. She speaks in feeling. Mm -hmm. And it, the higher self will never tell you to do something that will harm yourself or others. It will, you know, there's a comedian I talk about in the book, Maria Bamford, and she's this Los Angeles comedian. And she's like, oh, my higher self, you know, told me, you know what? you really should go and buy that Chanel handbag. <laughs> Perfect girl, you know, Oh, thank you. Intuition, my intuition, you know, and, and it was a funny joke. It's like, maybe I could make the case. Maybe your intuition did say that at some point, but like, usually it's these broader lesson fields in some traditions, Angelica, it's super cool. If you haven't heard this, I want to share like, the, the, the question would be asked in what was in, an, in the Native American tradition called the male sweat lodge, like the male lodge would come up with the question and then they would take the question to the grandmothers, to the, to the women. Oh, wow. And, to, and so the men came up with a question. They send it to the grandmother's lodge. The grandmothers come up either. First of all, they decide if it's even a worthy question. <laughs> 
If it's not, they just send it back. Try again. <laughs> and then they come up with a different question until the question itself even has validity. And in that, the answer will come back. Now you are the male and the female in both the lodges in the story. So once I was sitting with this practice and the question was something about my body. I asked the question. The question immediately, immediately was sent back as the wrong question. Hmm. It was something superficial, something based on an insecurity around my looks and some guy, right? Am I pretty enough of something silly like this, right? But I mention it because we obsess over these things. Mm -hmm. Try again. That wasn't even, that question wasn't even worthy of a soulful answer. And in the response of try again, that's not even the question. My whole body was filled up with this pulsing light, mm. this honey golden worthiness. And the question is absolutely dissolved in the field of body love of knowingness. So practically you can just pause, put your hand on your heart. What is it that you're dealing with? Please, you know, spirit, whatever you want to call it, guide, guidance, my higher heart, mind, please come. Like, what should I do with this or what? And you'll, you'll get an answer. It can come in the feeling, it can come in the thought realm, but sometimes the answer is ask a different question. Mm -hmm. So I could talk forever about this intuitive knowing, but that's really what a practice is. It's getting better at differentiating our different voices. Totally. I love that of asking a question because I do think a lot of times when women are starting to connect with their intuition, guides, universe, angels, all these things, and they're like, it's radio silence. I'm not, me. I, I'm not getting anything. Like no one's sending me the signs and whatever. And um, that often comes up too of like, well, like it's, it, it is the question that the shoulds or like, would it be better in this way? Should I go right or should I go left? Um, oftentimes I know that that's like really a thing with women too, of like, is this the right way or is this the wrong way? And it's like, that's not even the, the question. Like there is none, like you are the, you are the path, like you are the choice. You get to create the life that you want to live. Um, and yesterday I was in session with someone who, uh, was very pitta and was, had a timeline, made these great changes in her life. And she's like, okay, where's the relationship? Where's the career? I did it. Come on. And she goes, what, when is it going to happen? Like, is it soon? Like, give me a date, you know, all these things. And just like an abundance of water and flowing, lots of like kind of feminine and flowing energy was like what she needed to receive. And it was in that, that like, we had such a great discussion of like, that's not even you, like, you know, like when you get that, in, it's like right here, it's, that's not the thing that you really want. Like what your soul is really craving. Like this is asking you a whole transformation for you to be in the flow of life. Like if you got that one thing in life, then you'd be worried about when the next thing is going to happen. It's not going to solve your issues. It's you being in trust with the universe that you're always going to be supported. You're always going to need what you need in that moment. Um, and yeah, it could be not the thing that we want to hear, but it's definitely the thing that, that we need to hear in that moment. But it's the truth. You can do all the practices right, all the therapies right, all the daily routines and diets right, all the biohacking. You can do all of it and still not get what you think you want. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even be like a celibate tantric nun in a cave doing your five hour practices, which I've been and still not get what you want, you know? And like that whole setup is what we're attempting to see where we are like orphans calling out to our divine mother, mommy, feed me from the refrigerator of, of good things and take from me the bad things. You know, it's a very childlike relationship and I'm not throwing off on your client. I see myself in her. I've done all the things. I've done all the trauma therapy. I've done all the this, I've done all that. Seriously, I'm dealing with this again. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think one of the, an interesting uh, terminology I've been thinking about lately, Angelica, you may have even heard me talk about it is spiritual materialism. And that's what that is. 
And we all have to be watchful of it because mm, it's like, well, if I do my practices, then I'm going to become this really spiritual person. Or if I do my practices, I'm going to manifest. Or if I do my Ayurveda, I'm going to have a perfect body. Or if I do my dating inquiries and blah, 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 I'll manifest my man and all this. And, and like that whole setup is really a field for a lot of disappointment because there's a bigger matrix sacred mandala that's underway called the path of your soul that doesn't really care as much if you get the perfect job or the perfect body or the perfect boyfriend or the you know perfect whatever it's let it's it's here to teach us the lessons that we need to learn that unfortunately many of them actually are forged in the fire of not getting what we want mm -hmm. that's the setup the the setup is often the disappointment of loss mm -hmm. and and then by the way uh oh now you got what you wanted uh. oh really how great is it <laughs> right but then like, what happens either it's you realize that you didn't want it all along how many times have i like longed for a boyfriend oh, gotten with a dude had him in my life and been like get out of my room I want to <laughs> <laughs> like, go home. You know, like, or you get the perfect job and now you're working all day and you miss your old life as a yoga teacher you know it's like and the sutras actually talk about this you get what you want and then you realize it wasn't it, or you get what you want and you did like it, but now you want to keep it. <gasps> oh my God, I've wanted a baby forever. Now I have a baby. Now I'm an obsessive mom and can never let him go. And I'm a helicopter mom. I mean, there's this, the whole setup is really about avoiding the things we don't want and calling in the things that we do. And that setup is actually the setup of misery. Mm -hmm. So, how, and that might sound like bummer, but like, no. <laughs> By holding the tension of those opposites, we actually enter into this third realm that is a realm of freedom, which mm -hmm. is no matter what is occurring in the field of my experience, I am going to open to it. That's what it means to actually be powerful, to actually be free, to actually have dignity, to actually walk the beauty way. And Angelica, let me just say one more thing because my heart is so tender right now. Any radiance that you see in me, any light, anything. And I know there must be some because people keep coming to our school and coming to our classes and signing up for stuff and saying, I see myself in you. I see myself in you. Any, any light that you see in me is a direct result of having my heart broken and saying, I'm going to stay the fuck open. It's not from getting the good. I will tell you that it is not from the New York Times bestseller or making some good money or getting a cool body or any of these great things that actually have happened in my life. It, 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 that sounds like such a brag. Those things are nothing. In fact, they sometimes brought even more trouble. It's from the heart opening through usually being a little disappointed or completely annihilated. <laughs> Definitely. Another thing I remember too that you brought up. So last weekend I was in the ocean. And I remember you said one time, I think we were talking about the divine feminine and you had recently gone through like a really scary incident in the ocean where uh, like your, your body went through, you didn't totally go into it, but it seemed like pretty like fatal, like life or death type of situation. And you were just saying like, this is showing me like how wild like mother nature can be like she doesn't really care she's like doesn't care at all and she's really rough and i was like oh okay like i haven't experienced that but like you know it sat with me <laughs> last weekend i went out into the ocean and i got caught in a riptide and i never knew that before i mean i'm from chicago in the midwest i don't i, don't, I barely knew how to like swim in the ocean <laughs> and I, all of a sudden like i'm looking out i'm like oh <laughs> the swimmers are a great deal <laughs> away from me right now i should probably swim back and i couldn't like she kept pulling me back in pulling me back in and there was such lesson in that of like no like she has all the control like there i am so punitive and in comparison to her and just that wild like i don't care kali type of energy was so interesting and i think that's the same with like as we go through in life like you go through these breakdown moments where you're just completely shattered but 
those are the moments, like you said, like they are so gratifying because you build yourself up the resiliency, the confidence that you learn. You're like, oh my God, I did that. I literally was a shattered glass on the floor and I built myself together to be even stronger. Like those are the moments that you're most proud of. But for some reason in our culture, like we feel more vulnerable to share, even though those are the ones that people want to hear because they're real. And that's what I love about you. Like there's just always realness. Like there's no, there's no facade of that. Like you've never talked about your glories in, in any way. Cause that's not the interesting part of it. The interesting part is that you've been through the hell and you're okay with it. And you've built yourself up from again. And you never gave up. Thank you, babe. That means a lot. It's so amazing to sit here with you too, that went through our program. You're young, you're on the path. And I can just see, it's like, you know, when you, you can see your future self and I see this old lady, like with all of these amazing women of all younger ages, where we're all sort of just calling back to one another and saying, Hey, I've been there young lady. When you didn't get pregnant, when you lost the baby, when you went through the breakup, when you didn't get the job, you know, all of these things that women and men go through and to call back and say, if you don't harden, if you don't harden, there will be this great um, gift. You know, I have to read you this, if you may. May I read you this poem from Please. Pablo? I just, it's up on my screen. I've been working with it with my mentorship girls. And, and it just speaks so elegantly to what I think you and I are kind of dancing around. And it says, if each day falls inside each night, there exists a well where clarity is imprisoned. It is our task to sit on the rim of the well of our own darkness and fish for fallen light with patience. You asked me about intuition. That's it. There exists a well where clarity exists, but it is actually dark. Mm -hmm. and um and that really is what a meditation practice is it's being willing to sit with yourself because when you do you're gonna encounter all the things that you're running from which is a good definition of your darkness mm -hmm. yeah and i think what's hard too is you can be in process like you were saying before like you don't know how long that process is going to be like you just have to commit like and you don't know when's going to end and that's where the trust is like is it ever going to like <laughs> will i be in this forever um and that's where like the trust expands so much more and i know those moments i i had one again recently like it always happens where i'm like how much can i really take like i know you're expanding my trust muscle but like are you sure like i'm being really stretched right now like i get it i get the messages and it's so hard not to be so critical of yourself and to take it on personally and finally i'm I, i'm at the end of whatever that cycle was and i look back and i'm like all that wasted energy of thinking that i couldn't and and all that was and i could have trusted and loved myself all through that way but it it is always through that process where the most transformation happens so I was looking back at our first two episodes. I feel like the first one, we really dove into divine feminine. And then the second one, you brought up this concept of, well, actually a lot of the women that I'm working with need to heal their masculine energy. Um, they're too much in kind of, I wouldn't say maybe like feminine, but maybe like complicit and need to, you know, take action again, which I found as well. Um, and now I don't know if this is just like unique to my brand because I do attract a lot of clients who need a lot of feminine healing because they're very um, uh, more fiery types. But I'm wondering if you're noticing like a different shift in in the collective um, with these two energies. Yeah, you know, I, I was so fortunate last year to be able to sit in a, a PhD program for Jungian psychology uh, for a, a semester. And then I subsequently dropped out. So I'm a PhD school dropout. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't for me. It, it wasn't embodied. I, I couldn't do the like 20 hours of talking and thinking and writing, but it was amazing. It was so amazing. One of the great wise teachers, an older gentleman, he stood up and he was just, he had clearly dedicated his entire life, Angelica, to the study of the masculine and the feminine through the lens of Jungian psychology. So what a, what a sage, right? And I was like, 
just bubbling with these same questions my students ask me. And I said, but, but I feel that I have a broken masculine and feminine. Like, what if you need, I think there's this way that we get fixated on, am I in my feminine right now? Or I'm my masculine. Do I need to heal my feminine or is it the masculine in a way it kind of keeps us a little stuck. And his answer to me was so poignant. And he said, all of us need to learn to mature. What a good word. Need to learn to mature our inner feminine and our inner masculine. Mm. You may have a lot of clients and I do too at the Shakti school that are like badass little type A go-getters. That's not the masculine either. That's, that's, <laughs> that's still the immature masculine. It's just running right. around. So, you know, and like, dude, let the dude do it, right? Like that's that's what young men need to do. Young men need to f- have sex and build buildings and learn how to channel their aggression and all of this stuff. Same with the inner masculine in us. It, we have to learn to mature it, uh, whether women or men. Same with the feminine, right? So I think this idea of all of us on the planet right now learning the conversation of the maturation of the both and what does that look like for for each of us is kind of a cool approach to it what what does it look like to be a dignity filled woman and what does it look like to be in an integrity filled man totally i feel like that nails it because in the back of my mind as i ask these questions i'm like I know I'm going to go through more phases in my life where there's different versions of this. So just that like verbiage of mature is, is everything because it says that there's an evolution to it. Like you really think about what your relationship was to these energies when you were younger and how they're like, always they're always growing and evolving, like based on the different cycles that you're going in. I think that's really awesome too, just to hear that like a man was, was devoted to that. And he was like able to come to that conclusion and I, I'm single. I have a lot of friends that are single my age and like early thirties. And it's a very interesting time right now because half my friends are married and kids. And like, you could just really see this like stark contrast right now. Right. And then there's the single people. And so I'm just like really digging in. I'm having a great time. I'm, I'm really digging into learning all about this and, and how people are feeling and making these decisions and specifically men too. Like, I just find it so interesting like what they're going through like culturally and i feel like they're just going through like a huge shift in maturation as a whole what if you noticed with men like going through this um type of like kind of up leveling like and them going into the next stage like in the collective like i've seen there is a lot of men who i feel like who are a lot more like emotionally intelligent and in their masculine in the sense of like able to provide in all different types of ways and feeling really equipped and able to, um, to take action and all these things. Um, yeah, I guess there's not really a question in there, but I kind of want to know like where, yeah, where are you seeing like men right now and like what their stage or maturation is? Oh girl, (laughs) where do you live? (laughs) live, Well, okay. I'm being kind and I'm being honest. I mean, very kind right now. I live in Los Angeles. So You're in a definite um, particular subculture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've i been in that particular subculture as well. You know, I lived in San Francisco for, I think, like six or seven years. And, and that would be kind of similar to Los Angeles. And maybe not, though. Let's Let's talk about Love Island. So on the show Love Island, if anyone is familiar with it, you have a bunch of young, hot, single 20 somethings, right? And they come together and they talk about their feelings for one another. And it is a psychological study in just human sociosexual dynamics that I find quite fascinating. And what's been really, really illuminative to me as a 44 year old watching all these 24 year olds is how much the men. And they're not just in the Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York bubble, right? Like they're just got regular guys, right? How much they talk about how they're feeling. Mm. To feel we could think of as a feminine quality. To think is a masculine quality. If we were going to divide those, it doesn't mean women obviously don't think. We both have a left and a right brain, which is essentially what we're talking about, right? And so 
it was so amazing to watch this and then juxtapose that with men who are in their my era in like I'm a I'm like called an elder millennial. I was born on the cusp with uh Gen Gen X and uh or is it Gen Z? I'm an elder millennial. And my parents who are boomers, right? So my parents, the men, they would never talk about their feelings no. for an hour. Never. Right. So now you have these 20 year old men who are talking about their feelings, but there's a downside because often these young men are so caught and haven't actually been adequately maturated into their masculine that now the women don't want to sleep with them. Right. So how do we find this balance? And I think it comes from truthfully from a very traditional Ayurvedic perspective where men initiate men into the maturation process through rites and rituals some of them were maybe patriarchal fine we must update them where we 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 enable little boys or people with that more of that nature to enter into their aggression and their sort of ambition and their drive and their and yes they're they're fighting with one another in a way that can be channeled in a healthy way without in any way demonizing it and so our culture has done this huge disservice to these young men because they've said that the masculine itself is toxic. Right. Is there toxic, are there toxic behaviors? Absolutely. Does it have anything to do with actual masculinity? No. You know, we, in shocking school, you know, I get hard on the gals. I'm like, guys, there's just as much t- quote toxic femininity as there is masculinity. And we, we go into that. And so I think it's it's really just this question of all of us honoring the fact of the insipid level of darkness that we all carry mm-hmm. and how that's affecting our experience and our relationships. It, call it masculine, call it feminine. At the end of the day, you know, Angelica, when you're with me or you're with someone else that you might really love or respect are you thinking well is she in her feminine or her masculine I'm, <laughs> I'm doing that with you I'm not doing that with my boyfriend I'm just enjoying the presence of this other human now does he inspire me in a way that makes me feel more feminine? sure right but sometimes he doesn't another thing I must say because you did ask and I want to give my honest opinion from personal experience being a 44 year old woman who has never been in a sort of traditional marriage with family situation. Definitely yogini on the edges of fringe society, me, right? I'm a traditionalist at heart. But what I can say, having observed men over all of these years, is there is a hidden crisis of heart, an epidemic of heart and meaning and purpose and value that is so detrimental to our world it's detrimental to women it's detrimental to society men are offing themselves off at rates that we can't even believe the fentanyl crisis primarily is affecting men women are wanting to get married and have babies with men less and less and less and less and so i don't mean to be all doom and gloom but i think we've for, we've forgotten about them in a way and we've made it taboo in society for them to even speak about it totally Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's so interesting, the facet of like the competitive nature with like reality TV. Like I never, I never thought of it in that way. Like, oh, that's why that, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Yeah, it's so, it's wild. I I wasn't going on dates or attracting guys I felt were at that level of emotional intelligence where they were initiating clear, direct, like a lot of these like very attractive masculine qualities and someone who, has been taking those on because I'm single and had to for a lot of my life, I have to be really careful to not, especially in the beginning, to take that step back and to say, okay, are they going to step into that? And that was like a huge issue for me for a very long time because I think just the age gap between like women maturing and men maturing in general. And cause you talk about these cultural cultural differences that are happening right now. It, it's just like, no, I, I don't want someone who is, is not going to like step up to the plate, but that I do feel a lot of empathy because I don't think that 
yeah, it's not seen as like men can like start to like talk about their emotions and their feelings. They weren't given that before. And it's not seen as masculine. Um, but at the same time, they're now they're afraid to be canceled because if you're too forward, if you say the wrong thing, like I know a lot of women are probably like rolling their eyes, like, oh, we don't need to like feel bad for men, like just step it up and figure it out. I think I think the fact that you and I feel afraid of even talking about it points to the whole issue. Mm. Our culture has made certain conversations taboo and Tantra is the opening to the taboos, right? So like, you know, so we, we, the healing actually lies in that, which is unsaid. It's sitting beneath the surface. I feel so much. I completely, you and I are so similar. We look like we could even be cousins, you know, like how do I go on these dates? I'm such a capable woman. I can make it all happen. And then they're not showing up. But like, I think, and again, it is a little bit of a generational thing, but imagine your whole life. You've been trained that you don't want to be like this. You don't want to be too forward. You don't want to take the role of leader. You don't want to set up the date. You want to make her feel like she's an equal and all these things, which of course we are. But I think your aged women, I've noticed, are starting to go, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. For us. And I love that. And just keep ringing that bell because what you're doing, you're tapping in to your essential feminine nature in respect to men totally that was a discovery that i did not see coming of this and just finding more of my feminine energy was how much i could be in it with a masculine presence after being single and i could do it myself and passionate and forward i i truly forgot how much you can really soften and become this like wild woman if you truly feel safe in someone's presence and you truly feel that protective energy that men can just so naturally exude and brain, there is just nothing like it. There really is nothing. It's the best thing in the world. <laughs> and to deny that we love that is to deny a part of our being, you yeah. know? And, you know, like, like this whole conversation, all of these things are super personal and nuanced. And yet we can find these swaths of, of, similarity within our experience you know one of my very very closest friends is a lesbian and they they're having these same conversations as you know like it's mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with gender or genitalia or anything it's polarity i think is what we're talking about this classic dance of shiva and shakti and and the real master is the one who can involve herself with 360 degrees of her superpower given the situation and she can learn to play with that and I mean for me it kind of is just natural as as it probably is for many but I when needed can be the leader of the Shakti school that's not the same as stepping into the softness of the feminine with a partner Mm -hmm. it's it's a very different thing just as men can or those that want to be more in their masculine can show up in this way can also lay in your arms and cry like a baby when needed. And I think the deeper conversation is what inside each of us have we denied? And to bring that forward, to bring that to light is going to enable us to have much more 360 degree relationships. And, and I think it becomes really an interesting conversation. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. I think this is our best one yet. Oh, good. <laughs> I want to end on that note um, before we do, and I'll have everything linked in the show notes. Um, But how can our community connect with you if they want to join Shakti School and get their Ayurvedic certification? Um, What is their next best step? Well, we have a great website where they can find all all about us, the shaktischool.com. And we'll give you a link, Angelica, you can give them to our free mini course so they can take a whole long you know, four hour step inside Shakti school. If they're interested in it, set up a coaching call. We've got it all. We've got real people. Um, yeah. Join us January, 2025. We start, but they should sign up now as we give you like nice little gifts when you come in early and lower prices. Oh, I love it. Perfect. I will have that all linked below. Um, and thank you so, so much. I feel so 
fulfilled and like I'm so excited for my day now because oh, hey. I love conversations like this and you you do have such a light to you. Um, so thank you for sharing your wisdom and for being on as always. Thank you for having me. Likewise, real pleasure.